You're listening to the Co-Creator Network. When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Spread the word. It's time for the Dr. Robert Show. Join him today with his guests as they explore current hot topics about healthy living as food for thought. And what do the stars say? A look at how you and today's events are influenced by the cosmos. I want to believe with thought-provoking prophecies about UFOs, star visitors, disclosure, and the 2012 awakening. Each week, new topics on relationships, conscious business, science, and technology all bring better understanding to our daily pursuits. Education will determine how our kids think in the future, and we will examine provocative new ideas in art, music, and dance as well. And now, it's time for Dr. Robert. Well, 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 hello everyone and welcome to the show. It's so great having you here. It's always great being back. What a great day. Actually, what a great week. Well, let's just go for it. What a great life. When we embrace who we are and we fall into ourselves, it is the most beautiful experience that we can have. So take a big deep breath, inhale it in, be it, love it, feel it. Ah. I'd like to welcome everyone to the show today. I've got great, great people here today. Renee Barabo, our practical shaman chef. Bobby Marqueso, everything about ufology. Our good astrologer who knows so much about the stars, Joseph Anthony. And of course, our beautiful Barbara St. John, who will talk to a lot about today, about more information on grief recovery, grief therapy, and uh, all things that about letting go of the sadness. Uh, and I have a really special guest today I met not too long ago. I really love her. Her name is Dee Munsterman. And she's a fabulous, fabulous person. Lots of great information that she's going to share with us today. So without any further ado, let's get this show started. <laughs> And once again, on this segment of the show is Bobby Marqueso, our resident ufologist. You can learn more about Bobby at www.bobbymarqueso.com. Hi, Bobby. How are you today? I'm wonderfully well. How are you? I'm good. I'm really good. We're having a little bit of a foggy cold spell this week in California. Oh, okay. I'm not really used to that. It's kind of enjoying the sun more than ever, but it's kind of interesting. I feel like I'm in twilight. Yeah, no, I've <laughs> I'm in uh, South Dakota, Rapid City, and I've done some work here for the past week. And uh, there's a place called Lead, which is just up in the Black Hills a little bit. Heavy snow, icy, snow-packed roads that I haven't driven on in quite a while. And, and it's just straight all downhill. You're going downhill from Lead back to the bottom, you know, to come back here to Rapid. Boy, that just was not fun. <laughs> I forgot how to... Yeah, you forget. You forget how, the, you know, you've been in it. You d drove that way for years. That's yes. how I was in, in New York. But then <laughs> when you're not in it, you go, oh, my God, it's foreign. You're scared. How, how do you people do this? <laughs> you know. Why do you people do Why this do is you... what I ask. <laughs> <laughs> so what's new, Bobby? What's on the horizon this week in the UFO world? I. So to update everybody, I have not still seen a UFO. Just so you know, I figure we'll do it just like weekly updates. Like maybe this will be the week. And it's, yeah, nothing yet. And and it's it's wonderful, again, being back in South Dakota because the skies are so clear, so many stars. And I I see satellites all the time, you know, and, and things like that. But, yeah, still nothing yet. But it made me think, you know, when I when I expect to see a UFO, I want to see – a light that moves out of the ordinary, something that either all of a sudden does circles or it shoots off or, you know, that faster than a bullet type speed. So I look for that. And then I, I also, interesting enough, you know, I, I listen to other people's reports and I look up in the sky and then I, I want like a blackout effect. In other words, you, you can tell when there's an object there because maybe it's just straight black, but you don't see the stars anymore, right? And this is what some people have talked about with uh, triangles, the black triangles. And so I always thought it would kind of black out or the stars would blur in just that little area, you know, like if it were under stealth mode or something. 
And it got me to thinking about, you know, some of the black triangles they've actually talked about. A lot of the black triangles were actually ours. In other words, we have reversed engineered and uh, some of the UFOs that people are seeing nowadays could possibly be of the military variety. And, mm. and then some not, you know, I mean, and so, um, but here is an explanation of black triangles that just makes me shake my head. So the declassified research, this is from the Freedom of Information request from the UK Ministry of Defense. They have released to the public and they have drawn several conclusions as to the origin of the black triangles. Their research concluded, here, be, be prepared to eye roll. The research concluded that most, if not all, black triangles are formations of electrical plasma, that interaction of which creates mysterious energy fields that both refract light and produce vivid hallucinations. It wow. further suggests, I'm reading this word for word, further suggests that if not all, but a vast majority, may be due to atmospheric, gaseous, electrically charged, buoyant plasmas. Who the hell comes up with that? If you I know it. They do. They do come up with this. It's always no matter <laughs> what it is. Oh, it was a weather balloon or it's just some gas that, you know, <laughs> there was a big brain fart in outer space and the <laughs> gas came up, you know? <laughs> I know. And I, I've never heard, I've never heard swamp gas be put so eloquently as atmospheric <laughs> gaseous electrically charged buoyant plasma shut up it's a ufo come on <laughs> so i just yeah it's an insult really these people now look i've seen some of these witnesses you know they come on yeah boy i tell you i was looking up there at one of them skies because we were sheeping and uh, and next thing you know, there's this black. Jo now I know, but these people are genuine. They got no cause to see anything different, and it blows them away. I work with these these farmer guys who are so down to earth and just so straightforward, and I work with them psychically, which that's a hoot. You know what I mean? Like that's tough to get them to to believe this kind of stuff. And they're not just going to go around talking about UFOs and swamp gas. So anyway, so be prepared. Listen, you're either going to see one of ours, a UFO, but most likely you're just seeing atmospheric, gaseous, electrically charged buoyant plasmas. So get over it. All right. Next on to our next piece. <laughs> Russell Crowe. Did you hear that he shot a UFO? Not shot physically, but uh, has has video or uh, camera work of a video of a uh, of a UFO. Are he you had, sure he just didn't throw it? Are you sure he just didn't throw a phone at it? He did. Oh. <laughs> Boy, you hang on, Robert, don't you? <laughs> well, I was in New York when it happened. I oh, was actually you? staying at the same hotel, <laughs> oh. and it was kind of a big deal. Everybody made a hoo-ha about it. Oh, that's fun. I didn't know you were at the same hotel. Do you find yourself going back and ducking now just to get out of the way? You know, it's I stay there a lot, and it's very interesting that, you know, you could be sitting at the bar, and in walks Paris Hilton and her sister, and they order a Coke, and they have their reality cameras with them. I don't know why I'm not aware that I one of them are doing a reality show right now, but it comes up. It does. Yes. These kinds of conversations still come up. <laughs> That's funny. So Russell had shot this video and he tweeted that he had shot this UFO video that he'd captured this UFO on camera and it was out for quite a while and, and it did look, it looks pretty amazing, but now it's coming. So then, so then there was that. And then there was somebody who came along and explained exactly what it was which again, depending on what you believe, the guy in my experience, and I, I don't want to give it away, I guess, because I think, I think if you want to see it, you can, you know, you can just, you know, like we talk, everybody do Google Russell Crowe and his UFO, watch the footage and then update yourself as to this guy's explanation of what it was. The guy's got a reasonable explanation, but now it's coming out that the UFO, everything was just a hoax. They're saying that he wanted to create new buzz for his new film coming up. And they say the video consists of actually three time-lapsed photos. Now, Crow is insisting, of course, he set up the camera to capture fruit bats that were appearing outside of his office. His office was in Sydney, Australia, and he said he was videotaping this. And, and then um, YouTubers were shooting the video down and, 
and the actor was trying to defend his evidence and all that kind of stuff. But there was a chief video analyst for the Mutual UFO Network, MUFON, that told, of course, of all sources, and you know it's real, TMZ, <laughs> yesterday they did said that Crow's UFO <laughs> is misidentified due to the camera's slow exposure time, and it's actually supposed to just be a, a sailboat. But again, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to ruin all that for you. But look at the video; it looks really cool. And but but to go so far then is to say that that uh, Russell was was shooting this to hype his new film. First off, his new film is called Broken City, but it's got nothing to do with UFOs or aliens or anything like that. Apparently, it's in theaters now. But watch the video, see what you think. I I tend to go more towards this guy's explanation of a sailboat and the over over time lapsed photos and and that kind of thing. But I I don't think I agree with the fact that Russell was trying to hoax things for a new movie. I just don't. I don't no, where where is it? Where is the where is the video again? Tell me. It's I've... it's Sydney, Australia is where he took it. But if you um it's outside of his office in Sydney, Australia, and it does overlook the bay where there are slips, you know, boat slips, where, where there's a lot of sailboats. And you can most, uh, there's a lot of sites that will have the video on there. Um, that, and then uh, you can just push play and, and watch it for yourself. It's at night or kind of at dusk. And then the, then the video just shows this slow moving light going across. And then what they're saying is that sailboats, if you can picture just a, your classic sailboat, that there's a light on top of the mast that holds the sails. That's what you're seeing move across the sky, and then it's so close that it looks like it's a light, and beams of light are coming down. It's difficult to describe. Tough I have to, to look at it. Huh? I have to take a look yeah. at it. I mean, is it moving in a is it moving in a horizontal, the same yeah. exact plane and slow yeah. motion? Yeah, and they're saying that that you know, that really the sailboat is just drifting in. You know what I mean? Like it's. Like it's drifting in, and I totally can see that because then he puts a real picture of a sailboat and talks about the light that he that he has there, and he puts the two together, and it makes sense to me. I kind of like the idea of a UFO being in you know, thinking that we're going to mess with everybody. We're going to come in in the low horizon with one solitary light on, and we're going to make everybody think we're a sailboat. Right. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny because I've heard that explanation too. When when uh, some guy was trying to say, "No, that's a UFO," and so he said. That looks like a that looks like a balloon to me. And the guy actually said, "Well, that they'll do that. They'll disguise themselves as balloons like that so that not everybody can see them. But keep watching, you know." And I'm like, "Oh my God, this guy's supposed to be a psychic and the caller in of UFOs." And that was actually well, his thank, explanation. Well, thank God for Beavis and Butthead. <laughs> oh, oh. Oh, oh. Well, thank you, Bobby Marquesa, for joining us once again this week on a humorous edition, uh, edition of U of UFOs of the Dr. Robert Show. Have a great week. You too. Bye-bye. And once again, joining me on this segment of the show is our illustrious practical shaman chef, Renee Barabo. You can find out more about Renee at www.thepracticalshaman.com. Hello, Renee. How are you today? I'm great. And how are you today, Robert? I'm really, really good. We're having a very interesting month and a very interesting month worth of topics. Yes, we are. Um, we're kind of talking about consumerism this month. And, and are we the culprits of our own um, bad eating and bad choices, or are we actually making a mass move towards better decisions as we go forward? Well, what do you think? Well, I've got to say something that's been recently a lot in the news that I wanted to talk about was that Whole Foods has agreed to uh, label all of the products in their store by 2018. I, <laughs> I think that's kind of like, what is that, 2018? And it's a little bit far off into the future, considering that's five years away. But I guess it really takes time and production for people to make new labels. I think so. Also, they have to get a relationship with the, um, you know, their wholesalers. Right. And, I, and I'm not sure how the, this is going to impact people on the wholesaling. But what I really wanted to talk about it is what, from the standpoint of what has caused that move towards uh, these labels? What it, What's going on here? You know, this is such a this is such a complex topic that I could debate both sides of. And and I don't. You know, do I want to say that we should be, you know, eating genetically modified foods? I, 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 
I think it's something we've talked about this before that we've been creating over, you know, 50 years from the reason of starvation to now just uh, consumer expectation of great looking products. So, I mean, it's a really tricky subject, Robert, that, I mean, just goes on and on and on. And I'm sure both sides are just as equally as convincing. I think they are, and I think that's where the test, the litmus test is, is because the GMOs have been able to show, much like the artificial sweeteners and uh, a lot of other groups have been able to show the FDA that there is no harm. The, uh, and this is really, and I know we can get into a whole conversation about the FDA and, you know, who they really are and what all that is. But I do think that, I don't know if that's really where we need to be focusing. I think what we're, where, for me, the, the issue is that it's the, because they can um, trademark and they can patent their seeds and then start taking over all the other farms based on the fact that those seeds blow in the wind and then get into those farms and then they start uh, suing the small farmer for using their seeds without um, approval, that's where we're getting into some real danger here. We're, we're, we're eliminating the small farming communities and it's becoming sort of corporate farming. I think people are more afraid of what that means than anything. Well, and I think we've discussed before, and I feel very good to repeat. Um, many years ago, I drove, drove Robert Thurman to a, a function, and he was talking about that in order for us to succeed with this eating of a, a different quality of food and living, we were going to need 300,000 new farmers in the next five to 10 years. And, you know, this was probably eight years ago. And boy, he really saw that coming because there's just so much more labor intensiveness to this uh, natural and organic farming than the others. But but with, you know, a company like Whole Foods being pressured to buy consumers to start to label, I think that that's a move in the right direction. But what their concern is, or is like we were talking about last week about, you know, people are seeing that the burrito they just ordered has eight, 1080 calories, but you know, will people, once they get this, will they really read the signs? Will they really care? Um, you know, who, whether or not is this again, one more band-aid to fix a bigger problem. And, and one of the things in my research that I've learned is that one thing that we haven't really affected in our, all of our uh, Occupy movements and stand down movements and stuff like that is that Monsanto's profits can continue to rise, and they also are so far removed from any competition. Did you know that? I did, and you know, because the Monsanto thing keeps showing up all over NPR and a lot of uh, 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 of the feeds that I look at in the world. I mean, most people probably have no clue or could care less, but I think what you're saying about Whole Foods is important from the point of view that they have a much more conscientious dieter, someone who is about nutrition. They're looking at foods. They're looking at the care and the health care that they want their children and families to have. They're also more aware that eating better lowers their medical costs, uh, the probability of having um, major problems or reduce from a better diet. So they're obviously going to be the group that's going to move forward with the ideas of sustainability and wanting to know what they eat and making being able to make a decision of whether or not I want to pick the GMO apple or I want to pick the non-GMO apple. You know what I'm saying? So I think that's it's, it's just the beginning of what will become a bigger thing. Look today, Whole Foods, when they started back in Austin, Texas in the early 70s, I was there. I was part of the movement, uh, knew the owner, was spent time at his home. Uh, and uh, the idea of that was one store. And look, it's now a global community. And now you can go because of them, you can go to so many places around the country and the world and order foods in restaurants and go to other grocery stores that have become competitive to buy organic, to buy even seaweed salad, something that 20 or 30 years ago you would have never seen in a Safeway or a Kroger's or a Ralph's or whatever. So I do think there's an impact. We just, it's a slow impact. I, I do think that, you know, I mean, I, I definitely think that in, but, but I still, I mean, I still believe that, you know, I'm not a conspiracy theorist and I believe that what started out 
really what was an idea to feed people when people were starving and you know trying to get a, a food solution has now become you know a, a, an animal or that we really don't even have the impact or the ability to really do something about I think I've told you about this the woman who ate within 10 miles of her home on Whidbey Island last for a whole month and how difficult it was to get more than you know a certain handful of staples every month and so you know we're kind of in this thing where now that you said we can get seaweed salads at Ralph we expect it you know if we really want to get really clear back on our eating maybe we need to kind of come home to what we should be eating when well that's a huge huge topic for discussion for sure and it could get it gets into a bigger topic that we don't cover on the show but what about global population once again you know, is there any conversation at all about reduction of population on the planet? Are we educating ourselves to understand that the more more people that are landing on this planet, uh, the more land they're going to be taking up and the more opportunity to have to feed a lot more faces? Where, where is that conversation? Or is it a conversation that is even important? Well, you know, if you're asking me, you know, we're talking about chocolate covered strawberries and picnics in bed. So, you know, I don't know that I want to tackle that. I'm talking about, I, I have a, a certain romantic relationship with food. <laughs> <laughs> well, darling, don't ever give up that romantic relationship with food. I think one of the things that was brought up last week that you had also mentioned this week is that the idea that our, our, is the calorie counting working? Do people, I mean, it may be a conversation you want to have with our listeners about what is calories and how do you decide how many you're supposed to have today and where do you find out this information so people are more clear about their caloric intake? I, I think that there's a whole, there's, I think parents first are the ones that need to be educated and perhaps, you know, in the birthing classes that you now have to watch before you take your baby home from the hospital, maybe they need to implement, you know, the food part of that. Because don't even get me started on the, the formulas. What they know is babies who are formula fed have a much higher percentage of a chance of uh, type 2 diabetes. Because, uh, you know, that, that high fructose corn syrup that you're looking at everywhere, sure enough, shows up in the baby formulas as well. So this whole eating paradigm needs to change from the, the milk that babies are fed all the way up to the foods that they're taught to bring to school. And, and, and I know parents that have really struggled with this issue when they send in their box to, oh, this is another, the same kid who was mainlining the, the maple syrup. He got in a fight with somebody at school because he didn't want his healthy lunch that his mother had sent him. <laughs> and he stole the other kid's snack. It tossed his uh, off to the wind. It's a different world. We're living in a much different world than the one I grew up in. I mean, if I got an apple, I'm either in the winter I got tuna sandwiches because it was cold enough to have them in your lunch pail. The summer there was no tuna because of the heat. You know, it was a bologna sandwich or it was a cheese sandwich or it was a pimento cheese sandwich. I'm from Texas. We ate pimento cheese. And, you know, that was about it. And you got a drink, usually a carton of milk. That was lunch. Right. Now, <laughs> now it's Jell-O products and sugar products and Hamburger is on the menu every day. Yes, and you, they get choices at school. So, well, we got more to talk about the subject for sure. So, you know, we're going to continue this dialogue. But in the meanwhile, right. please come over to the, the Shaman Chef and let me know what you're thinking and what you'd like us to talk about here. It'd be great. Thank you once again, Renee Barabo, for joining us today on the show. Have a great week. Thank you. And joining me on this segment of the show is my good friend Joseph Anthony, our astrologer, always taking a look at what's going on with the planets and the stars. You can learn more about Joe at www.planetswithin.com. Good afternoon, Joe. How are you today? I'm doing well. I'm doing well, Robert. Um, you know, feeling the uh, the buzz and the energy that's increasing. I'm sure you are, too. 
<laughs> well, I am. I'm really glad that Mercury went direct on Sunday, I guess, and St. Patty's Day. I guess everybody had a good time, and now we're here in the middle of the week, starting a whole other week in the middle of the month. Absolutely. And it's, it's amazing how many people on Facebook now are understanding when Mercury goes retrograde that it affects them because they, they notice they have a tendency to go back in time. But that's all going to be put behind us uh, as uh, – as as everything shifts, uh, starting today, as a matter of fact, you know, as oh, exciting, exciting. What's going on? What's the new shift? Well, Some fun, I hope. Oh, absolutely. Well, everything is ship- shifting from the watery sign of Pisces, which they've been in for, you know, most of these planets have been in for the past month or so. And now they're shifting into the fiery sign of Aries. And the sun is the, the is the primary um, the primary planet that's moving forward. Uh, first, and it, it goes into Aries today, actually I already went into Aries today, early this morning, and immediately we could feel the shift or this energy just begin to increase and our energy levels go up. So this is, a, this is the start of four weeks or five weeks of intense sort of motivation and a desire to accomplish, to go see, and, 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 and our energy level just, just increases by tenfold. And... Um, there's going to be a couple of interesting aspects to this um, this energy that's coming in because there are going to be other planets that join Aries. Uh, like tomorrow on the 21st, we have Venus entering Aries as well. So now we're multiplying the energy even more. Venus represents romance and partnerships. It also represents finance. And when it shifts into Aries, there's more of a drive or a desire to increase our income. Or if there's somebody that we're really passionate about and want to get to know, we are be, we become impulsive. It's like we can't control ourselves. So here we have on the 21st this desire to move forward in in many different directions. And if that wasn't enough, then we have uh, we have um, we have another sh- uh, another event taking place later on this month, which uh, has to do with the the moon, which is the full moon. But we'll get to that next week. But um, this week. Look for increased energy starting with today. And as the sun goes into Aries now, it starts to make difficult aspects with Pluto and Uranus. Now, these are the the two planets that have been causing all this havoc and all this change and all of this uh, societal movement, you know, like the Occupy movements and so on. Because Uranus represents the youth, but it also represents revolution. And Uranus has been in Aries since uh, 2010, and you could see all around the world how people have just gathered together to say, hey, we've had enough of this crap, you know, stop controlling us, and so on and so forth. So there's a tendency to break free. And on the other end of the spectrum is the um, is Pluto and Capricorn, which represents the structures, the powers that be, or as I like to call them, the powers that used to be. Um, uh, any institution like government or, or, or religion or, or even big corporations, anything that controls society on a large scale. And we see the transformation taking place there. So now when the sun enters Aries, immediately over the next couple of days or so, it immediately runs into difficult aspects from an astrological standpoint uh, to these two planets. And then it causes us to react in impulsive ways or in weird ways. Uh, feeling the frustration or feeling tension or on a, on a positive note, having the extra energy to do some sort of physical activity, you know, exercising or, or cleaning up the garage or whatever, you know, you're doing. Um, but this week, the energy, look for the energy level to increase tenfold. And especially, and I have to caution everyone, especially on the 22nd and 23rd, because Mars, which is the ruler or associated with the planet of Aries, is already in Aries. So there's a lot of impulse there. There's a lot of drive to accomplish. But it's going to be meeting up with the revolutionary planet of Uranus. Now, these two are going to be right on top of each other. It's a conjunction. So what that means is anything could happen. Any bright idea that comes into your head may just appear out of nowhere. Uh, I've also cautioned people while they're driving or, 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 or traveling in some way because uh, Uranus is sudden change uh, and Mars is about movement uh, moving forward. So this alignment is going to be um, – could be a very positive one or it could be a very cautious one. So I want people to just be aware of their surroundings and pay attention to what you're doing. 
because this is a lot of energy and please don't take it personally and watch the tempers and because there's a tendency uh, to lose our tempers or lose our focus when these two get together because it's like we're trying to assert ourselves with all this fiery uh, Aries energy, you see. So going into the weekend, uh, you know, the moon shifts into Leo, which uh, definitely will help us a bit more. But Leo is also about challenges and creativity. So being that we have all this Aries energy and fiery energy, now we add the moon and another element of fire. So I would say look for uh, exciting activity this weekend or if there's a project that you need to do or, or complete, uh, whatever that is, this would, be the, this would be a great weekend to do it in. Now, the other thing I've also mentioned, Robert, is there is that possibility, we astrologers have to put this out there, of some major event taking place this weekend. Um, whether it's an earth change or some revelation or, or something in the news that really just surprises us, this is the weekend for it. Okay, so I would say everyone pay attention because uh, there may be some news that comes out of nowhere that, you know, we're quite su surprised by or startled by. Um, but I would say pay attention to your intuition even more because um, with all this energy increasing, the momentum, the drive, the desire, and the ideas um, just come to mind a lot quicker. So pay attention to that. But the weekend uh, looks pretty good. I know it's uh, a religious holiday for some, some Catholics. I believe it's Palm Sunday, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and then we go into Monday and Tuesday, which is, is, an, is the Jewish holiday starts on um, Passover. But we're getting ready for the full moon on the 26th next Wednesday. And this one is going to be in the sign of Libra. And I'll talk more about that uh, next time. But as we go into the full moon, uh, there are going to be all kinds of thoughts about relationships, partnerships, agreements, anything that we uh, do with other people. So I want you to pay attention that this energy that's coming in from the full moon uh, Monday and Tuesday leading up to uh, Wednesday is really asking us, the, the part, is the partnership that I'm in good for me? Uh, should I move on from it? Do I need new partners? Uh, and I'm talking about business, personal, whatever endeavor you're involved in, co-workers, because Libra is the sign of the scales and is the sign of partnerships. And uh, there will be some strong aspects to this, so we're going to be questioning everything uh, regarding that partnership. So Monday and Tuesday, I, I would say it's kind of a, a low day where we don't want to overexert ourselves, but um, it should be relatively uh, quiet, uh, but leading up to that full moon, we will definitely question ourselves and question uh, where we're at and where we're going. Uh, Libra can be a little indecisive, so uh, with that full moon, there may be an element of indecisiveness coming in. Just remember, folks, that we're, we're, we're transforming. We're going from one way of thinking to another, and that's what the Mayans are talking about, shifting consciousness, awareness, uh, shifting societal awareness, everything on every level is cha is changing. So I think, uh, Robert, we've got a lot of energy coming in this week. So it's time to amp it up and prepare and uh, use it to our best uh, abilities. So, Well, I, I think that's great. Thank you so much, Joe. I, I, you know, this is right in alignment with everything you've been saying for the last couple of weeks about how much the push uh, energetically is going forward. This is the time to do the things that you want to do that are create more success in your life and more happiness because you definitely have the energy behind you to really move forward in the direction of your intention or prayer, right? Exactly. There's no stopping this energy, Robert. Uh, Aries energy is impulsive. So uh, if there's a moment uh, that you have an idea or something, you're not going to be able to stop it. So you might as well just roll with it and then uh, see where it takes you. Absolutely, because anything can happen. Okay, Joseph, thank you so much for joining us today on the show. We look forward to your report next week. Again, you can learn more about Joseph at www.planetswithin.com. Have a great week, Joe. Thanks. And on this segment of the show is joining me Barbara St. John, our grief specialist. 
Barbara knows a lot about everything there is to know about grief and the counseling for grief. She's a specialist, an intuitive specialist, I may add. And you can learn more about Barbara at www.barbarastjohn.com. Welcome to the show, Barbara. How are you today? I'm great, Robert. How are you doing? I'm good. You know, Mercury's direct. We've got, you know, good St. Patty's Day behind us. Life is good. That's awesome. Well, listen, Barbara, it's good having you on the show again this week. I know that you've got a very interesting topic. When I start crying, will I ever stop? Well, that's a good question. What is the answer to that question? Well, you know, Robert, there are many misconceptions about pain associated with the emotional losses that we have in our lives. And some relate to the reaction of others. You know, for example, uh, people will say, it's not fair to burden them with my pain or my grief or to keep talking about it. Or, um, you know, I have to be strong for others or you have to be strong for others, such as mom or dad or the kids. Um, And some relate to how we think we should be reacting to the loss. You know, for example, people tell themselves, I should be over this by now. You know, I I kept myself busy, I should, you know, I kept moving, you know, what's wrong with me? Um, And one of the most hidden and dangerous fears is that if I ever let myself feel the pain that I sense, I'll start crying and I will never stop crying. And that's the one thing that a lot of my clients talk about. They will say to me, Barbara, you know, if I go to that place where all this pain is from the grief, from the loss, I am going to be curled up in the corner of your office and I will never be able to function again. Um, And it's precisely that kind of incorrect assumption that keeps us locked, you know, in this uh, unresolved grief and pain and sorrow. And, you know, some people, Robert, will take it to their grave and they never really have peace in their life. Um, They've lost someone and they can never get over it. Um, And yet, based on what we've been taught in our society, it's the most logical extension of everything we have ever learned uh, is to understand what grief really is. You know, we've been taught from our earliest ages that, you know, sadness or pain or negative feelings are, you know, you're supposed to avoid them. You're supposed to push them down. I always use the word muster it up. You know, we have to avoid them at any cost, not show them to our family, our friends, the public, um, even to ourselves, we try to hide it. Um, And, you know, there are people that we talk to and they they do say, you know, Barbara, I don't know, they'll start going into that pain and they'll say, I don't know, I I don't know, I I can't, I can't stop crying, I can't, I can't. Um, And so... You know, sometimes as a child, too, we're told to knock off that crying, you know, or I'll give you a reason to cry. or So those are things that are running in our minds once we begin to enter into the pain. You know, these programs from our childhood are now running. The beliefs, the ideas, the concepts of the people that raised us. And God bless them, they were our parents, and they, they did do the best that they could. But there were times when they didn't allow us to have the emotions that we were having. You know the old thing, smile and the whole world smiles with you, Robert, or cry and you cry alone? You know, you've kind of heard of that. And there's there's just a small sampling of some of the remarks that have, you know, dictated the reactions that we have in our lives about loss, which come from, again, you know, our, our parents or our environment or the society we live in. And um, so, and we do them to survive. And we also want the approval of people, so we kind of, we say, okay, then I'll, I'll do whatever I need to do. And you can picture a, a tiny infant unhappy about something, and you realize that the infant is communicating this displeasure at the top of their little lungs. You know, they're just screaming and screaming and screaming. And you think about it, you recall infants also express pleasure at the top of their lungs. You know, they can laugh and giggle and make us laugh. They make no distinction between happy and sad in terms of the volume of intensity. You know, I've heard a child laugh as much as, you know, as loud as they cry. So as children move out of infancy, they are socialized to reduce both the volume and the intensity of that feeling that they're having in response to life. So they're told, you know, how to act and how to react. So this might be somewhat acceptable if both happy and sad were merely muted a little and muted equally. 
but that's not true. Unfortunately, the only sad side gets seriously crimped. That's the part that says, no, 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 you can't go there. You know, happy, joyful, positive, all this, these feelings. We're allowed to have those. And those can be shared with others. But guess what? We're not supposed to share the pain, the disappointment, and so forth. So the other half of our normal feelings uh, are isolation and separation and aloneness. And that's what happens when these feelings are not expressed as a child. Um, you know, a child will, will go to their room and, and, and sit and, and try to figure out this pain and how are they going to function day after day after day. And then they create these habits and these programs or do, you know, to survive, which I say are isolation or separation um, or aloneness. And, um, you know, we do live in a society where a lot of people are right now separating from themselves, from their families, because of all the losses financially uh, that people have been going through. So isolation is a big one in this country, and separation, which creates the aloneness. And with all those beliefs and habits as a backdrop in our lives, it's almost entirely logical that we might be terrified to show or express any of the normal, natural reactions to the losses of any kind um, because we're going to be so judged. Um, it even makes sense that we might believe that if we, we started crying, we wouldn't be able to stop. And now we know where that comes from because of all the buildup um, of the pain that we have suppressed and the times that we have isolated when we really shouldn't have, when we really needed someone the most, there was nobody there. And the only one we could turn to was ourselves. And we didn't know how to nurture ourselves, and we don't. People have to come in and learn to do that. And that's a lot of my work is learning and uh, teaching people, excuse me, teaching people to learn how to nurture themselves and take care of themselves. That when they have that pain, that they actually acknowledge it, embrace it, um, and allow that to surface because it will affect their body physically. Many of my cancer patients, heart patients, leukemia patients, you know, it's all related to the stress in their lives, and the stress is related to the pain and grief that they never really resolved or allowed to dissolve within their frequency. So, you know, um, people have been hard on themselves. Um, you know, they have to give themselves a break, um, and they have to allow this to come up and, and love themselves just the way they are. And I often tell people, you're enough, because as growing up, sometimes we think we're not. So I'm enough to take care of myself, and I'm worth time and effort that it takes to take care of myself and nurture myself. And it may sound a little harsh and inhumane to say that we're programmed, actually, just like a computer. Um, and um, you might find it helpful that you do go in and you find out what those programs are and find out what programs are running and what messages that you received as a child that told you how to cope and deal with grief um, and defragment them is what I often say, uh, just like you would a computer. You can collapse them, defragment them, uh, delete them, uh, do whatever it is. But most of all, I tell people there's nothing to change. There's nothing to alter. All we need to under is to do is to understand where this program began, where these ideas and concepts about how to deal pain with pain and loss came from. Um, and I have yet to see anybody in my office who didn't stop crying, Robert. So at some point that does happen. Um, and so I really encourage people to um, go in, look at the sadness, the pain, the negative feelings that you may have, embrace them, and embrace yourself. And that's basically how I assist people in stop, into, into stop crying, into the stopping of the crying, I guess I want to say, Robert, and, um, and help them move on in their life in some joy and happiness and peace without the pain. Well, that's exactly where we all want to be. And I know what you're saying, Barbara. Thank you for that. There are so many people who do really hold it in. And I'm often perplexed by it because I was never one to do that. I was always the emotional, sensitive guy who cried at a drop of a hat. But, you know, I've always been amazed at the, of people who are really have the program. It's very tough. You never see the emotional response out of them. It's as if they're just internalizing and taking it all inside themselves. 
so it's a good thing that people like you are around to really, you know, say, hey, step it up. You really want to show that emotion. And, you know, what I often say, Robert, too, you know, um, you know, I always comment on your work because I love your work. And so the way that people are dealing with that pain needs to be understood. Um, and, again, it's sort of like you assist them in helping them to understand the dynamics through the numbers, how they're coping, and how they can realter that and shift that. Uh, giving them information that assists them uh, through the process um, and giving them the information and courage to do it. Well, thank you for that. One thing we do know, Barbara, is that we have where our, our support of the human race is to remind everyone that they're not broken. You're not broken. No one's broken. There's nothing to fix. You're everything. You, you come with all the tools that you need to have a fully happy life. It's just accessing those tools. All right, thank you so much again, Barbara, for your fabulous report today. We always look forward to having you on the show until next week. Have a great week. Okay, you too, Robert. Bye now. And joining me on this segment of my show is a beautiful lady that I met also not too many weeks ago at a conference I was at. She was introduced to me by a mutual friend, and I just saw her love and light. And I thought, you know what, I'd like to have you uh, on my show because you're just the, the cat's meow. So today I'd like to introduce Dee Musterman, and she is um, – I hope I said her name right. Did I just say your name right? Is it Munster yes, Man like or Munster Man? Munsters with a man on the end. Munster Man. I did say it. I did say it. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'm introducing Dee today. You can learn more about her by going to www.phoenixcolonhydrotherapy.com. I know it's a lot of words, but it's Phoenix colon hydrotherapy.com. You shall also be on the guest page so you can learn more about her by clicking on her guest page here at Co-Creator Network. Uh, Dee has degrees in both biology and metaphysics, uh, is a life coach and an ACE certified personal trainer. She's a public speaker, entrepreneur, a former classroom teacher. Uh, she's also certified in laughter yoga. I want to know a little bit more about that and yoga therapy. She enjoys writing, reading, hiking, and just hanging with her family. Can't beat that either. Dee's lifelong mission to inspire others to be healthy, Culminated with her career as a certified colon hydrotherapist, she has discovered colon hydrotherapy can be the missing link in the mind-body-spirit connection. We're going to learn more about that as well. Hello, Dee. Welcome to the show. Hi, Robert. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Oh, you're, it's my pleasure. I, I was saying to everyone just now that, you know, it was just sort of a really sort of a, a, a divine appointment. It was in, very interesting that the, there were a few people at that conference, which was the Death and Dying Concert Conference for the Arizona Holistic Chamber of Commerce that I was one of the guest speakers of. I actually connected with and actually feel I'm going to know for a long time. And it's always so heartfelt to be able to connect in that way when you, you know, get out of your own cave and go out into the world and muster up the energy to connect with other people, don't you think? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And with, with that type of conference, you got people who are who are real. <laughs> I mean, that was, that was nice. Yeah, especially death and dying. I mean, people are there on different levels all together, and they're coming together in community to really, you know, learn more, find more, just gain the support or be able to share uh, their story with what they're going through at the moment and their uh, adversity. So it was great meeting you there. It's great meeting you now. Um, I'm fascinated by your work. I see you, you, like everybody else, you're very multifaceted between the career move of the colon hydrotherapist stuff. There's all this other, you know, you're, you've got biology and metaphysics. What a great connection. Yeah, I, I spent about four years being, uh, I wasn't raised with any spirituality or religion or anything like that. And I, when I, you know, married an atheist and a family of atheists and I got a degree in biology and pretty much thought I, I knew how everything worked, at least on this planet. And then, uh, had a bit of an abrupt awakening a few years ago and then started exploring metaphysics. And, and now I'm still every day, the more I know, the more I don't know, but, um, things things make more sense these days, but you know. It's, well, it's science really is that. Yeah, well, science arrives us back to the point of our you know our appointment with the divine. I mean, I've always 
felt, and I'm like you, I was not really raised by atheists, but my mom was a Presbyterian, and I said to her, why are we Presbyterians? She said, well, when you, you and your dad and I moved to Texas from Indiana, I looked around for a church that had ample parking. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's just as good a reason to be a Presbyterian as any other reason to be anything. So I sort of didn't have that connection either. But the sciences for me have always been sort of the the way of really approaching what the divine is all about through a much more sort of uh, uh, record-keeping manual of stuff, through trial and error, and really the search that way. I never really think of scientists as being atheists, but I know a lot of them are. Right, right. And a lot aren't, like Einstein. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, well, he was definitely, he was working in a patent office. He wasn't even really being a scientist at that point. It's kind of fun. So tell me a little bit about the laughter yoga and yoga therapy before we get into the colon stuff. I love the idea of laughter yoga. Yeah, I, um, well, when I, I, my awakening, the brief version is I woke up one night and my house is on fire. And I, I don't know that I, it's not a near-death experience in, in this, all the things that you've been through, but definitely saw my life flash before my eyes and, and went into kind of what they call a freeze response and barely made it out. I had my dog die, my neighbors die, and it ended up being one of those big wildfires in San Diego, but it was, uh, I just happened to be in the first neighborhood it hit, so there wasn't any warning. And that just kind of blew, it took a few years, but it blew open my um, my mind, my right mind anyway, and I started to look at things differently because I had none of the material left and uh, got more into the spiritual realm. And But I it, I was very depressed for a few years and really didn't think I wanted to be here anymore because I, I, I started to understand more of the metaphysical realm. And then this, this world with all the, you know, buying of the stuff and just what was going on just made no sense to me. So I got kind of suicidal and I um, started, you know, I was reaching out to people. I had a therapist tell me I needed to stay on antidepressants the rest of my life, and that just pissed me off. And I started getting into uh, yoga and meditation, and I had a a doctor tell me that uh, she had been doing some research on the the science behind laughter. And it, it appealed to that part of my mind where, you know, there was actually physical or there was scientific evidence showing that just moving your face in a smile, like moving the muscles in that direction upward around the mouth stimulated the release of serotonin and all these other cascade of hormones in our bodies. And that even though my mind did not feel like it would ever be happy again, if I faked it, and she actually had me put a popsicle stick sideways in my mouth, which you can just do with a pencil or anything, and you can imagine the Cheshire eating, you know, Cheshire grin that you get. She says, just, <laughs> just do that while you're driving in your car. Just, you know, and she said, your body will start to, the hormones will be released. It'll start to heal your body, and eventually your mind's going to catch up. And she says, I know you don't believe me, but just try it. And so I did, and then it wasn't much longer that I, Later, I was, you know, walking, I think I was in a health food store, and I saw a flyer that said laughter yoga, and then I'm walking down the street, and there's a telephone pole with another little flyer, laughter yoga, and so I was like, okay, already into yoga, I had heard about this faking it, so I um, went to my first laughter yoga, uh, it's not really a class, they have clubs, and there's about 5,000 clubs around the world, and it started by a doctor in India who his wife was a yoga teacher, and they he was doing research on the the science of laughter and studying people like um, Norman Cousins who healed himself back in the 60s. I think he left the hospital. He had a terminal illness, and he went and checked himself out and laughed his way back to health. And then there's Patch Adams who Robin Williams played in the the movie years ago, which is an amazing movie, and he's a doctor who dresses up like a clown and gets the kids with terminal illnesses to laugh and helps them to heal. So there's a lot of uh, evidence that shows this works, and he um, started people laughing in this park in India. There were about five of them, and they they ran out of jokes real quick, and they also (laughs) realized that when you tell jokes, you know, somebody's going to be offended, as as you saw at the conference, Robert, when you were, <laughs> um, you know, it, there, there's always going to be somebody that it, it isn't politically correct or whatever. So he said, you know what, why don't we just laugh without the joke? Just, you know, just be silly. And um, I actually, I also call it the ego buster yoga, because 
You don't need a mat. You don't wear spandex. You just sit around and do silly, what we call laughter exercises, but there's really no punchline. It's just about engaging the physical body in this laughter. And what happens is because uh, being human, it's, it is contagious, and we, we kind of, if we can get ourselves in that childlike place and let go of our ego, we, we just start laughing and start feeling better. And the reason it's so healing is because we oxygenate our bodies. And, and it's proven that uh, cancer cells can't live in a highly oxygenated environment or an alkaline environment. And that was, uh, let's say, Otto Warburg back in 1931 won the Nobel Prize in Medicine for, for proving that. And so when people, when they start to understand why they're going to do these silly exercises and what it can do, and then they actually have the courage to do it, um, they end up feeling amazing at the end. And you just saw a little bit of it at the conference. We, we, we do what's called a laughter meditation. And, and a lot of times people just really go into kind of hysterics, which looks a little crazy, but when they're done, their bodies are feeling amazing and they they relax and, and they, you know, heal. Yeah. Well, I, you know, being out of your mind is actually, as you, I spoke at the conference about is exactly where we want to be because the minute we get out of our mind, we, we start tapping more into our heart and opening that energetic field, which is a much larger response communicator than the brain. So it's kind of interesting that when we go out of our mind, when we're laughing so hard, we're out of our mind, our chest expands, our rib cage hurts. I mean, even when I go to Disneyland and I'm screaming and laughing all day on the rides, at the end of the day, we're always talking about how much our rib cage hurts because yeah. we've expanded it out so much from laughing so loud all day long. And we're breathing much deeper and we realize we are a society or a, you know people who are very shallow breathers and especially women very shallow so it's interesting that the laughter therapy is exactly what you probably need at the time that you needed to jump start yourself out of your depression yes exactly and and then you just want to share <laughs> then you just want to share you want to share the love well yeah. i love the other part of your work here uh hydro uh therapist colon hydrotherapy i started colon hydrotherapy back in the 70s back in the day uh in california when i first lived out here and um, uh, where I'm living now. And uh, at that time, it was very interesting. There was even, um, uh, there was a lot of it going on, but it seemed very underground and there was all kinds of levels of it. I mean, I even remember I went through a point where it was all about, you know, doing enemas with coffee because it actually cleansed your colon and your liver and all this stuff. There was all these different types of ideas about the uh, approach to it, uh, and it's evolved over the years, and obviously since then it's become an entirely sophisticated program. So I'd love for you to speak a little bit about the work that you're doing in uh, colon hydrotherapy. Oh, sure. I, uh, I was always a fiber, water, exit-only kind of girl myself, and I uh, had, let's see, I was staying with my in-laws for about a month, and I was being polite and eating all their all my meals with them and and they think they're they eat healthy and and they don't and I finally I was just feeling literally like crap and I went and had acupuncture from a friend of mine and she says well why don't you, you go get a colonic and I thought oh yeah and to the point where okay why not I'll try it and the, the first appointment um, I remember walking out of there and everything was clear and bright and I, I it's just and it wasn't just physically like letting go of the the crap, it was this. It, it was more of a, I guess, a spiritual kind of experience for me. And I remember t- taking my phone right away and calling my husband, and I said, "I'm going to be a colon hydrotherapist." And he said, "Well, that makes sense." And, and I said, "Really? Because I think I'm a little crazy right now." But it, um, as I started to learn more about it, and actually was studying some of Edgar Casey's work, who was a, you know, as you probably know, a famous psychic from the late 1800s, early 1900s. What he says happens when you have a colonic is it um, actually can line up your chakras and expand your aura. And I read that. I realized, okay, that, that's, that's what happened on a spiritual level. There's also reflexology points all along the colon, just like people know, like on their feet or their ears when they get acupuncture. Well, when the water goes to the colon, it stimulates those. And the one down by the cecum, which is the, where the appendix is, which a colonic can get to, which an enema can't, is um, the the reflexology point for the pituitary gland. So the 
the third eye point in in Eastern talk or yoga talk. So it basically opens up, expands your awareness. And so that was very, um, that kind of to me brought it all together. It's like you can physically see the physical stuff leaving your body. So it's for people that maybe aren't necessarily looking for a spiritual experience. They just feel better because the colon absorbs water. And if they're all clogged up, they're not getting hydrated. They feel they don't have energy. So it just, on um, the mind, body, spirit, the whole thing kind of came together for me. And um, I, I, as doing, being a life coach, I look at this uh, fancy $20,000 toilet, basically, that I have in my office here, and I think of it as, you know, the maybe the couch that the psychiatrist used back in the day where, you know, you just lay down and let stuff go. And, and I really just hold space for people. I rub their feet, I rub their bellies and let them talk. And people are just... Um, I'm just witnessing miracles every day, either physical, spiritual, um, emotional, all kinds of releases um, happen in, in when people have the courage to look at their own shit, so to speak. Yeah, no, absolutely. And just really quick, it's when I was doing all this different work with uh, with a colon hydrotherapy, you know, back in the day for me, uh, and did that and continued that process uh, my whole life. I mean, it was all about learning that, you know, you have pockets within your intestines that hold bile, which actually are cause, cause cancer, and that there's, uh, you know, particles that remain in your colon for, you know, 20, 30, 40 years or whatever uh, that do not get cleaned out. I mean, there's all this other intense information that goes with it. Just a side note on that, when I had my my largest catastrophic event and ended up on an operating table doing exploratory work because I had hematoma at every major organ in my body, they split me open from my heart all the way down to my belly uh, to do this work. Later on, you know, here we go, time goes by, I'm in my healing process, and one of the doctors who was the surgeon came into the room and was very proud of their work because they created a really nice scar around my belly button. You know, they didn't like do some massive work that was going to leave me looking bad. He was very proud of that. But what he was really amazed at, he said to me, you know, I want to let you know that one of the things that amazed me the most is that you had one of the prettiest colons I've ever seen. Uh -huh. Normally, normally people have very messed up colons or very irregular bowels. They're not... Uh, you know, synergistic, and they're not beautifully laid out. He says, yours was like a map. It was beautifully laid out, exactly how it's supposed to be in the picture. And in my mind, I thought, here I am, you know, all these years later, getting an affirmation <laughs> over the work it that works. I had done with yeah. colon hydrotherapy in the most bizarre way. Yeah, I tell people it's like going to the gym for your colon. It really it strengthens that muscle and makes everything contract and work well and so they yeah so that's that's great what an affirmation <laughs> what an affirmation my i have one other thing i would like to I ask you about because i have friends that are dealing now with this new diagnosis they're doing called crohn's disease it's been around in our generation that's they don't know what causes it they have all these different ideas and theories and whatever I'm sure it's related to the diet absolutely the diet what uh what is your do you have any background with dealing with Crohn's disease and hydrotherapy? You have clients that come to you who are dealing with that? Yeah, I do, and uh, a little bit. And it's uh, Crohn's disease. Uh, you know, the, one of the theories I've heard that, that the, the people that I've had come have kind of confirmed is that it's a lot of times heavy doses of antibiotics as a child. And so that's one of the things that we kind of hand out a lot, much too readily in our culture. So... Um, but yeah, and then there's when when people have Crohn's, it's this inflammation of the the um, well colitis is just the colon, but Crohn's is the entire digestive tract, so the small intestine and the large intestine. And colonics can be beneficial if they are not in an, an acute state. If they are inflamed and really be having a tough bout with it, then I would wait until it's it's you know more of a relax. But it's definitely um, helped through diet and it's just really what I have learned is it's an individual thing. I have a young woman who has healed herself from Crohn's by using a raw vegan diet and doing a lot of juicing and she does the colonics. I've also had someone who used still eats meat and that's working. So I'm not one a lot of colon hydrotherapists will be like, you know, you have to be raw or you need to be vegan and all that and I, I really believe it's about getting cleaned out and tapping into your intuition and you're listening to your body 
and I still eat meat, and I, I'm careful with, you know, I try to eat as organic and as chemical-free as possible and as much fresh fresh food as I can. But um, people, you know, with, with Crohn's or just with anything, it's, it's about really listening to their own bodies and that not just letting the medical community just run them all over the place, which people tend to, yeah, not want to yeah. tap into their own their own stuff. So. Well, that's the key. I guess the, the real key here is intuition and, and having as clean and pure diet as you possibly can have. I uh, I eat less than 15 grams of sugar a day. I have a very concise, you know, calculation of the kinds of foods that go into my body. And, you know, you just get that way after a while. You become very uh, hyper aware of, you know, what is what the body likes and what it doesn't and where you're eating from stress. So and I'm sure that's directly related to a lot of your work. I tell you what, Dee, we have run out of time. I can't believe it. But I do want to ask you, you know, we've given you the website again. It's Phoenix colon hydrotherapy dot com. Uh, how that's how people can get in touch with you. Yeah, that's the best way, or they can find me on Facebook. There's not many Munstermen out there, so the Munstermen, M U N S T S T E R M A N. So it's always you, best. Robert. Google yeah. is it, right? I mean, yeah. Google you, and you can come find out. It's D Munsterman and. Uh, M-U-N-S-T-R-M-A-N. I'm really thrilled to have you today on the show. It always goes very, very quick. I'd love to invite you back in the future on one of our health segments. Would you love to come back? Sure would. Thanks, Robert. I appreciate it. All right. Well, thank you again. You can learn more about Dee at phoenixcolonhydrotherapy.com. She is in Arizona, so uh, it's pretty much related to, the, to that part of it. But with the life coaching and the other work that she's doing, she can guide you in many other ways besides uh, just the physical. Uh, thank you again, Dee, for joining us today. You have a great week. You too, Robert. Hello, everyone, and thank you once again for a wonderful show. Thanks to all my uh, good friends, Renee Barabo, Bobby Marqueso, Joseph Anthony, and Barbara St. John for joining me today on the show and our special guest, Dee Munsterman. We've run out of time. So without further ado, let's get this show over with. Till next time, love you. Bye. <music> 